get it together about a day ago. Digit is a robot that is ready for work, a pragmatic tool designed to be useful in the world, to go where we go, work on our terms, do useful things, and interact naturally with us, a safe and friendly robot partner to the human workforce. Our vision, our dream, is to build robots that free us from robotic tasks, that enable humans to be more human. And everything we've built, every breakthrough, is part of the journey towards that goal. That's where Digit is going. Digit is made for work. How would I define myself? Um, at the interface between science and engineering, understand, I like to understand how do things work, how do um, how do animals get around in the world and manipulate things? And how do we make uh, robots that can achieve the same physics and the same performance? I want to ask you, what did you learn when you started the company in 2015 till now? What are the major lessons you gained or insight since you've been already in academia and now in the real world application, the use cases? What did you learn in these years? So, you know, the journey of, um, going through really early on trying to understand how does uh, legged locomotion work and how does manipulation work and, and kind of the, the physics first of it and then all the way up through, um, you know, uh, university and academia and being a professor and then starting a company and then growing and building a company. There's been so much change and it has been um, on such a steep learning curve the whole time because the the culture and the ability to execute at each of those locations in each of those places is so different. Um, it's really hard to pick out like an individual lesson of what's the thing I've learned. Perhaps the, the most important thing that I've, I've learned again and again and again is how much everything is about teams of capable people who are interested in a similar goal together. And then it's all about figuring out how to align people about a really powerful and important goal and then um, coordinate as a team in order to achieve it. Um, at every stage of every step, it's been about that. Um, and so there's, there's many different ways to do that. You know, there's the, the setting a vision, having an idea of what you want to do. And then there's also the, um, the ability to communicate well and, and um, I don't know, make, make sure everybody sort of sees the same thing. Make sure everybody is able to understand how what they are doing is contributing to a, a shared goal and a shared vision. Um, certainly that's a challenge even in graduate school. You know, the thing you're doing is, is not necessarily just by yourself. You, you need to bring a lot of other people along, even in publications and even in presentations that you give. You want to bring people along on the ideas that you're sharing um, so that other people engage in the conversation. Um, and then in building machines in a research laboratory, you know, students and postdocs and, and others who are coming in and, and collaborator professors and so on, it's really about a community and a collaboration in order to um, seek to understand something, in order to figure something out, in order to, you know, achieve something. Everybody has to work pretty hard. Um, and then certainly at a company, it's about that, that vision for investors that they understand what it is that you're doing and can really get on board and behind it. It's something that they believe is going to be successful and valuable and important in the world. Um, employees who, who join the company, they join because they're excited about, you know, what the company is doing. Um, and then as it gets bigger and bigger, the, the challenges of um, excellent communication and continuous teaching um, 
you know, continue to grow and you have to build a whole organization around that. I, I think, you know, I've heard it it's so many times, it's almost cliche, but like building the organization or building the machine that builds the machine is, is oftentimes the harder part than, than building the machine that you're building. <laughs> so yes, building a robot is hard, but also building an organization that is able to execute really, really well in order to do it. Um, building a manufacturing entity that's able to create it um, is is arguably the more difficult thing. If you want to ask you the question first one, why bother building a humanoid robot? And the second part, that approach you have been doing many years and also digit, the inspiration is quite different from other humanoid, like ex exactly human. Yeah. What is the reason that you choose to build in a different way and develop and inspire the third clearly here? But the first part, why bother? having a humanoid uh, robot, race. That's a good question. Why build a humanoid robot? I would argue that we are not building a humanoid robot. We are building a human-centric robot. And the difference is that uh, human-centric means we're building a machine that is designed to work in human places, designed to go where people go, designed to work with people, designed to do human workflows. Um, and so it's really for people. It's about people. Uh, humanoid, I would say, is a description of how a robot looks or, or how it's shaped. So many of the aspects of our robot do end up looking a little bit humanoid. Um, but that's a result rather than a goal in and of itself. Um, and I can tell a, a, like a little story about that. Um, we started, of course, trying to understand legged mobility. And, and actually, I'll skip by the whole idea that uh, the legs are actually a little bit more like bird legs and that's physics first reasons to get there okay I'll skip that story and I'll say we started thinking about um, how to control the yaw of the robot in other words it's steering one of the big failures when we're locomoting at the time we were re really working on uh, bipedal locomotion one of the failure modes is that the robot twists sideways and then it's it's moving in a different direction than it is oriented and takes side steps and can fall over and there's really a very small patch on the ground that you have with your foot, a very small grip compared to the amount of inertia you have swinging around in the air with legs swinging. Um, so we thought about, you know, um, gyros and reaction wheels and things like that, which end up having a lot of dead weight. Um, and so really ultimately aren't going to be uh, useful. Um, and, and then thought about tails. If you put a tail on the robot the same way you would see for like a, I don't know, a, a lizard or a velociraptor or something like that. Well, that tail is there to change the, the pitch of the robot, so that, you know, or the, the animal, so that the animal can jump and reorient its feet for landing, which is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to control the yaw. So when you think about where do you put a tail to really nicely control yaw about your central axis, it's a bilaterally symmetrical pair of tails, one on the right and one on the left, that you can then swing that allow you to rotate about your central axis really, really effectively. Um, and of course, that's where our arms are, right? So then the other thing is that, you, you know, we really want to um, have some inertia to react against, uh, since this is dynamically stable, this thing is always balancing. And, you know, where do you put all of the computers and the batteries and everything? And putting it in an upright torso is just the only solution that made any sense. We can't put it in fore aft because then you can't go through a doorway and turn. You want your sensors up high, you want something to balance, like, you know, balancing a broomstick versus balancing a, rumor, uh, a ruler. You want something up taller. So then the arms go up there too because now your arms can be narrow against the body. They're not really wide like on either side of each leg. So again, doorways and human spaces. Um, the, then you want to think about like how when the robot is falling, because it's going to fall, um, how does it not break? And the arms are super important or the bilaterally symmetrical tails are super important for, you know, hitting the ground first so that you can then cushion the fall easily and then reorient to get back up. And having those arms on the right and the left is the best kind of workspace for being able to, to the reachability to be able to place those arms where they need to even for falling. So I haven't even gotten to the story about, you know, we want to pick up boxes and manipulate things yet. And already we're at something that looks a little bit humanoid with, you know, arms that are on an upright torso and, and so on. And so it's, it's kind of, a good thing, I think, that for multiple overlapping reasons, you get pushed to a singular solution 
that is not a compromise, um, you know, that's worse off for three other things. It's just actually the right solution. Um, and that's, that's why we end up with what we have. Everything that we do is about understanding why exactly are we going to make this shape or this feature, and it's been very physics first, to end up something that looks a little humanoid. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Maybe I want to ask you about the actuator here. Do you think that in robotics in general, do we need artificial muscle that resemble biological one? And how do you think having such muscles could shift the design paradigm for your company or in general? Do we need that or it doesn't make sense to you since you're already modeling the same behavior? I mean, in many ways, um, motors are better than muscle. Um, they're different. And I wouldn't say worse necessarily. There's a lot of different actuator technologies. And really the question is, um, how can you generate the dynamic behavior that you want? The whole purpose of building a robot like this is to engineer a system that through hardware and software as an integrated system, uh, you generate a dynamical behavior. And that behavior is walking or it is, you know, picking up boxes off of shelves or, you know, any number or, you know, unloading a tractor trailer. But boy, there's a lot there that is physically interacting with the environment. So forces are going back and forth. And of course, you have to lift your, the weight of your robot up on, on its own legs and be self, you know, batteries and everything on board. You can't plug it into the wall. Um, but muscles are not perfect either. You know, there's a lot of structure in how animals are, are formed um, with tendons that have uh, the right amount of compliance in series with a muscle, uh, muscle structures that are at different angles that are load dependent, um, you know, configuration dependent transmissions where tendons are going over specially shaped joints around a, 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 a knuckle or a knee or something like that in order to create a different um, gear ratio basically um, at different positions and different configurations. There's an awful lot of mechanical shape and, and structure in an animal body that is overcoming limitations of the muscles, overcoming limitations of the actuator dynamics. Um, building a robot and controlling it would be really easy if we could just apply whatever torque we wanted at whatever joint we want. Um, and that's how a lot of the simulations work, you know? You, you, in animation, you don't have to worry about too much about real physics. Um, but no matter what you've got, no matter what actuator you have, if it's an electric motor or hydraulic or air or muscle, they're all going to have different dynamic properties. And then very likely you will have to add something in series with that, some form of transmission and, and um, you know, impact tolerance and compliance and, and things like that to, to deal with it. So it, it's much more complicated than saying, do we want an artificial muscle? I would say there's going to be an awful lot of research and development over the next hundred years and more about how to best create an actuator that creates the dynamic behavior that you want um, for the behaviors of interacting with the world. I don't think there's going to be a silver bullet at all. I think electric motors are quite good, but I think that there's a huge amount of development to be done in how to implement them. Mm -hmm. Great. Maybe I want to ask you about the state of the market. How do you see the market uh, now for a digit, for example? And also another question about the use cases. Do you design the robot to be tailored to a specific use case, like warehouses here? Or this is not the case when you try to design the robot, yeah? So I see it as like a series of technology eras. Um, it's been a dream for humanity for hundreds of years, forever perhaps, to have machines that can do all the things that they'd rather not, you know? And uh, it's definitely possible and it's coming soon. Like we're kind of at this really interesting inflection point where um, we have robots that can operate in our space and our environments and go where we go. And that never was true before. Um, so in the next, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, just more and more robots in our spaces and our, you know, workplaces and factories and, and warehouses and homes eventually um, is going to become ubiquitous. It's going to be a common sight. Um, and then it's never going away for the rest of humanity, I hope, you know, those sorts of things are going to be part of our lives. Um, so the market, obviously, at that scale is truly vast, um, bigger than maybe any other market, you know, what is the market for labor? 
Uh, and if we can have robots do all of that, then we have, you know, discussions about what do people do in terms of creativity and variability and the things that make people human. And in fact, that's the vision of our company, enable humans to be more human. That's the whole point. Um, so, okay, so those are technology eras. I would say that's tech era number five, as I've kind of laid it out. Now, how do you get there? You start by doing one useful thing, right? And so I see tech era number one as having one robot that's on this path with this in mind, um, doing one useful thing, um, such that a customer looks at that and says, wow, this is providing value to me. I would like to buy this. Can I write a purchase order for a lot of these? Okay. And then tech era number two is one useful task, but scaling. And that's where we are right now. We have Digit picking up you know, plastic e-commerce bins off of a shelf and putting it on a conveyor belt. And there are hundreds of thousands of, you know, roles and places and in, in, in warehouses where right now people are doing that, but it's incredibly hard to hire people for that because it's one of those classic robotics jobs that it's very repetitive. It's very repetitive. Um, it's very process automated, which also makes it ideal for a first application. Um, so that's where we are right now is tech era number two that's doing one useful thing but scaling and having a bunch of robots deployed and doing that one useful thing. Tech era number three is when you start to pull in that second use case and that third use case. You start, say, not just doing plastic e-commerce totes, but now we're also depalletizing, um, doing sortation, you know, stacking the empty totes, and then working towards things like unloading a tractor trailer, which starts to get more challenging, right? There's more variability in that world. Um, but it's also more useful in a yet bigger market. So instead of selling just tens of thousands of robots, you know, it gets up to hundreds of thousands towards millions of robots in that kind of market. Um, and that's tech era number three is many robots doing multiple useful things. Uh, and then I would call tech era number four um, when we get to uh, having the programming interface to that robot be so simple and straightforward that customers and commercial entities can do that. They just buy a pallet of robots and then they open them up and then they can easily give the robot the instructions to pick this up, put it over there and do that. And then that kind of opens up the market even more to small businesses and others. It doesn't take a big deployment of a thousand robots in a warehouse with our engineers setting up the, the use case. It's now just much more accessible. And then eventually tech era number five is when you can just buy a robot from your home and you can ask it to take out the trash and you know, et cetera, all of that sort of thing. But our company can be and will be very successful and our focus and our goal is on tech era number three. Tech eras four and five are gonna naturally occur, um, but we don't have to get there for commercial success. We have to be in that multi-purpose, human-centric um, goal, that mission for our company of, of doing so many useful things for commercial customers. Very interesting. Maybe I want to stress about the software side because I think it's very relevant how to be intuitive and easy. And it's not the case, to be honest, for most commercial robots. So how is it challenging for Agility to make that intuitive software that you don't have to be bothered with a lot of things, especially in early stages of development? Sure. Um, so I would say right now the way it works is we need to understand a very specific use case um, to the point where we know we have a CAD model of what the shelving area looks like, what the conveyor belt looks like, what this, you know, the empty totes area looks like, and there's a specific location, a cell or work cell where the robot is going to be, um, and you know, we get that all ahead of time, program that and set up that action and that motion in the simulation, and then you know, being easy to deploy is one of the key values of, of something like this. So by the time we then come into the customer warehouse, we come on in and within a the goal is, you know, within a day or so, a day or so, <clears throat> the robot starts just doing that task because it's already been kind of pre-set up and it knows what to expect and it can register where it is in that known environment and start doing that task. Um, but that's a lot of work from our applications engineers. That is a, um, you know, large Fortune 100 companies who are working with us as a partner because they're on the on this path with us towards this uh, multi-purpose goal but willing to start by sharing the first early use cases and then work with us to get the robots deployed. Um, and it's going to cost us money, you know, more than we're going to earn by selling these robots in order to do all of that hand done engineer focused setup to make sure that the robot is doing that task reliably. 
Um, but over time, you know, it's building up the skill set. The robot is building up the skill set and the generality of it. Um, and over time, it becomes a much, much more convenient API that we continue to iterate and work on internally. So it's like our applications engineers have to use the API when they're on site to deploy the robot. They're filing hundreds of bug tickets and then working closely with our, you know, um, controls engineers. And then as that over time gets upgraded and upgraded and upgraded, it becomes easier and easier and easier for our applications engineers to deploy these things. And then, you know, you just take that out to its logical extension. And at some point, you just have chat GPT variants connected to a robot and you say, hey, Digit, you know, can you just pick up the boxes from over there and put them over there? And then ChatGPT spits out the whole set of instructions for how to do that or whatever, you know, data-based large language model kind of thing and, um, you know, starts doing the, doing the task. And then you still need a person there to have that conversation with the robot, say, oh, you dropped the tote, um, you know, or no, not over there, you know, put it over there or, or things like that. But it gets easier and easier over time with, with the tools that are coming online, all these, all these cool new ideas that, are, um, that we're starting to see. Interesting. Maybe I'll talk about the price component. I think that's something generally very expensive robots. Where do you think the cost could be down? Uh, maybe, I don't know, where do you think it's very high and should be reduced? Well, we're selling the robots right now. We're selling the robots right now at about $250,000. And, you know, we started selling our Cassie robot at that price uh, when we started the company. And we've tried to really hold that price, even as the sophistication and the complexity of our robot has continued to grow. Of course, Cassie was just a pair of legs. Digit has all kinds of sensors and then, you know, very capable manipulators. And uh, boy, the software product on it is, is even bigger. We have our software team is twice the size of our hardware team. So when you think about it, I mean, we've got basically an operating system running on a piece of hardware. It's a pretty, pretty big system. There's a lot to it. Um, and it's going to continue in that way. So a lot of the value is going to be in the behaviors of what it does, in the physical intelligence. The hardware is a big part of it, of course, in the manufacturing, but then there's a huge software team behind making that interface really effective and having it do useful things in the world. Um, so like I said, at $250,000 for one-offs right now, as we start to scale, that price starts to come down over time. Um, the manufacturing, you know, I think, you know, thinking about distant future, Okay, five, 10 years as we really start producing at scale and start being able to even do like eventually robots as a service, um, you know, they're in the $50,000 range. They're in the luxury car range of what it costs to build one of these. But then the value, the value of what the robot can do over three to five years is so much bigger than that. Um, so I, I, I don't know, it, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. I agree with you. Maybe another point about the noise. Do you think it is important to design a robot with much less noise, or is it not important when you speak about warehouses or whatever factory? Is it relevant or not to the noises, for example? Oh, it's produce, incredibly relevant. Produce? Yeah, the noise. I mean, the noise is one aspect of being human-centric. Um, there are many aspects of being human-centric. Um, just when you look at the robot, how does it make you feel? Um, and then when the robot starts moving, how does it make you feel? And then when you're working next to one of these robots working with it, how does it make you feel? Um, even just the simple case of being in a workplace, it's really important for people to view our robots as a tool, as something that is useful to them. Um, think of it like a service animal, where there's some very, very limited amount of intelligence and capability with it. Um, but it's, it's helpful, and it is safe, and it is friendly, and it is... Uh, making your life easier and making your job easier. That is the goal. That is the intention with our digit robots. Um, so sound is part of that, right? If the robot is stomping around like, uh, like a Cylon, it's going to wear on people pretty quickly. Um, and I think that people have often exclaimed when a robot is, you know, standing there next to them and then, you know, they're like, wow, I can't even hear. That's very quiet. Um, yeah, it, it just doesn't really make a lot of noise. It, um, you know, right now when it walks around on concrete, we get a few clumps and clanks on the ground. Uh, but, you know, we know how to make it as quiet as a person walking around. We have um, patents on how to do that and how the engagement with the ground works with the feet. Um, our actuators are quiet, nearly silent. And then, you know, what I expect this is going to be like um, in the 
and the uh, you know the current version of the robot is it's like a laptop. Uh, if you're working in a in a trailer that's 140 degrees on a hot day, it's going to get kind of loud as the fans come on to keep things cool. But under a normal day and normal circumstances, you know the robot is going to be very quiet and and comfortable to be around. That's very interesting. Maybe I'll ask you about the emotion part because I think you touched it in that quickly, but. Did you receive any reaction, like, I, I don't know, for example, kids see some this robot creepy or aggressive a little bit, and some just, did you ever consider how this robot could be evoked emotion if it's, if it's work alongside a human? Did you consider that in the design or it's not relevant to you? It's critically important to us. Again, how the robot moves and how it looks and how people perceive it is part of being human-centric. So, you know, for us, it's really quite, quite important to have people look at it and feel a sense of they're pleased by it they're interested in it they are want to engage with the robot but you also need to set expectations because it's not a social robot right <clears throat> so I don't know one example I can give is when the robot is turned on and balancing and standing in one place um, the robot is capable of standing so still that it's not perceptible at all if the robot is moving. So when a person stands, they're kind of shifting their weight usually and always a little bit in motion. The robot can stand so still that people perceive it as an inanimate object like a table or a chair. And then when it moves, it's a bit of a surprise. They didn't realize that it was on or that it was balancing or something like that. And anytime you surprise somebody, it breaks trust a little bit. And you know we really have to be building trust so that people intuitively know what to expect from, from the robot, just like they would from another person or a service animal around them. And so even something as simple as having the robot shift its weight a little bit, just as an artificial thing that we make it do, then people around it register it as a thing alive. And um, it's not even something that's conscious, it's something that's just in the back of your mind. And then when it does move, it's fully expected. It's not a surprise in any way. Um, the head on the robot that we have with the eyes that are animated with very simple animations are along that same line. It's something that indicates the intent of what the robot's about to do. It indicates that the robot is alive and on. Um, and, and it just gives people a sort of set of expectations of what the robot is about to do and how to respect the robot's personal space. And then they have the expectation that the robot will respect their personal space. And that's part of how you be human centric. Those things are quite important. Hey, have you seen that new Chit Chat GPT update? No, I haven't. What does it do? No, it's awesome. You don't even have to work anymore. Oh, cool. Very interesting. Maybe I want to go quickly for the sketches you, uh, for Agility Publishing. I think it's funny sketches, and I'm just curious about the idea behind that showing that it's not, it's a robot that when you try try to capture and you are not a robot. Can you talk about the story? I think that's really funny that it's just not seriousness, but a, a funny side. I find this brilliant. So can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, these robots, like I keep talking about how they're human-centric and not humanoid, right? But boy, it's easy to personify the robots. It's easy to anthropomorphize these things because they do look a little bit humanoid. People name their Roombas. People like, you know, of course, they name their pets, you know. It's, uh, people like having a relationship with things. And when something is as human-centric as this, um, you know, that's going to happen. And so 
Um, you know, we're pretty careful around it. That's why our robot is, it's not gendered. It's an it. It's not a he or a she. It's, um, our, our whole industrial design effort is, is organic, but not anthropomorphic. So we don't want to try and mimic or copy any like musculature or things like that. Um, we really want to make people know and, and be clear that the robot is a, is a machine, is a robot. Um, but, but is still a useful social robot. It's like another entity. It's like people know how to treat a cat. Um, this is going to be very much like that. People know how to treat a robot. Uh, but, you know, if you look at like um, a stuffed animal, um, you know, people like those. The face can be incredibly simple with just a pair of very simple eyes and maybe no mouth and, you know, maybe something that doesn't look anything like an animal or person, but is some sort of monster that's even that's super cute. I don't know. Um, now, we're an industrial machine. Our robot is made for work. So it's not about being cute, but it is about capturing some of the being very simple and being very clear about the cues that we do share intentionally. Um, and then, I don't know, it's fun to, it's fun to joke about that. It's fun to think about how um, this machine is in no way is it a human, and, uh, but people personify it. I, I, I don't know what else to say about it than, than that. I mean, people are going to put it in costumes, and, and we do, and um, you know, think about it for what it is and kind of explore that in, in storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe since it goes on, I have a few questions. Maybe the first one about safety and the bench point and the robot. How do you see safety? And I think also, yeah, maybe the bench point and these things, how make sure. Yeah. Okay, safety is a great one. Um, <clears throat> when we deploy these robots, you know, and, and boy, safety, it is such a big topic, such a bigger topic that I think most people even realize. It starts to actually safety gets out there into the, you know, the anti weaponization clause and uh, letter that we've signed and, you know, how robots in broader society impact things, even all, all the way down to, you know, what you're talking about, are like pinch points on the robot. And I think the thing to keep in mind is like, this is an, it does need to go through industrial safety OSHA style requirements. Like, we need to think through every single possible thing that could go wrong that could possibly injure or hurt a person think through everything and write that all down and document it thoroughly and then start collecting statistics when the robots are deployed and are in use and how likely are these things compared to how likely we predicted they would be and if something is likely like how likely is it that someone's going to stick their hand into the pinch point um, how do we mitigate that through some sort of either eliminating the pinch point or putting a sign there or keeping people out of where the robot is you know, through some method of mitigating that risk, and then how effective is that mitigation in ensuring that that risk to, to people is incredibly low? Um, so that that's critically important at, at every stage of the robot. And I think of safety kind of as there's there's three different pieces of it, and I hinted at this a little bit earlier. The first one is that the robot needs to respect human personal space. In other words, the robot can't go run into somebody. And there will be a lot of things that seem simple to people, but you know, but aren't to the robot that are social in their cues. And I think a lot of autonomous vehicles are running into this as well. Like, you know, the classic question of what do you do when four cars are at a stop sign? Um, and there's a lot of subtle things that people do about inching forward and so on to communicate to one another an intent and then sort of negotiate a, uh, a shared path. And then who goes first? There's a lot of that in crowds and, you know, walking on sidewalks and, and so on. The robot is going to have to be good at respecting human personal space. Um, the second one is... The robot needs to communicate in very natural ways um, to enable people to respect its personal space. So, you know, if a person does something that surprises you, is not what you expect, typically you give that person some extra space. You lose a little bit of trust. And it's exactly the same thing with the robot. If the robot is walking down the hallway next to you and then it just turns right into you, now you're going to give the robot some space and you don't trust it anymore. Um, but the robot's going to need to be able to, if it's going to want to turn, for example, it's going to look that way, turn its shoulders that way, indicate what it's about to do, and then, you know, pause, do that social dance, and make sure that it avoids a, avoids a person, but the person's going to avoid the robot, too, if there's that intuitive uh, read of what the robot's about to do. Okay, so we have the robot needs to respect people's personal space. People need to be able to intuitively read the robot's intent so they can respect the robot's personal space. And then the third one is... When people do come into physical contact with the robot, it needs to be safe. It needs to not injure them in that case. And so that means the robot has to be exceptional at knowing what forces it's applying on the world 
And remember that the robot must be able to apply large forces to the world in order to walk or pick up a 30 pound box. That's a requirement for the machine. And that amount of force, if applied in the right way, has the potential to injure a person. Every human being has that capability for every, against every other human being. Um, and yet we do fine, right? And so the robot is going to need to, um, there's going to be a lot there about figuring out statistically um, and proving that when you are in physical contact with the robot, it's very, very unlikely that it's going to apply a large enough force somewhere that can injure you. So I can say that, um, now I want to separate two things, right? So on the one side, there's this process that's necessary for us to prove with data uh, that the robot is safe and also is um, safe with the public, safe with uh, warehouse workers, safe in the environment that it's in, um, show that and prove it. And then there's the other side, which is, you know, as a research coming up, up and developing these things, what is my personal risk tolerance of how I interact with the robot, being an expert, being experienced with these things, um, and, and then my own risk tolerance, right? My own risk tolerance with the robot is I would feel far more comfortable on a daily basis hugging the robot and being in physical contact with it and messing with it than riding my bicycle into work. Um, so they are, you know, they are my judgment, my personal judgment is that they're very safe to interact with. But that's not necessarily true for, say, um, a child that's coming up near the robot and doesn't know how to treat it and doesn't know what the robot might do and doesn't have that intuitive understanding of, of its intent and, and, you know, respecting the personal space and the pinch points and so on. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work to do to make sure that it is safe in that kind of environment, in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Three questions for you. The first about the energy. How, how do you see the battery? Do you think we need for, uh, I don't know, long hour charging, charging batteries? Uh, what is your view about the energy here and hardware also, if it's, uh, if it's relevant also? Yeah, um, half of the power that our robot consumes is computing power. Um, and it operates, you know, two to three hours when it's doing work. And then the thing that really matters is uptime. You know, how many hours in a 24 hour, like in a 24 hour cycle, how many hours is the robot doing work and how many hours is it charging? So if it can do two hours of work and then charge in 15 minutes and then get back to work, um, that's a pretty good uptime. Uh, and typically it's not useful even or necessary to be doing a continuous eight hour chunk. Actually, if you think about people doing uh, a task, they also don't do an eight hour chunk. They do an eight hour chunk with breaks and lunch break and things like that on the way. The robot's gonna need breaks too. Um, let's see. Battery technology is changing quickly. We're going to benefit from that. I would say that. Um, what else can I say about energy? The, the locomotion and the physical interaction of our robot is quite efficient. It's really surprising to me that so much of the power is consumed in computing. Um, and that also tells you kind of how much room there is for improvement over time. Because uh, we haven't optimized that. We've just put the biggest, most powerful processor and you know, graphics card and, and so on that we can on there with a lot of very power hungry cameras and LIDAR and sensors and things. So um, when efficiency starts to become a really economically driving force for the machine past just doing the job well, um, there's a, a lot of room for improving the efficiency of, of the robot, quite a lot, reducing its weight, um, improving its efficiency of the actuators and improving the computational efficiency. So I, I think that sort of naturally it's going to get out past two hours to three, four, five hours, and then, you know, eventually more as batteries get better and as the robots get much more efficient at doing their jobs. But it's also about fast charging. It's about doing the job for a while, go and click in and charge really quick, like you do the super fast charge on your phone and then get back to work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good point. Maybe the last question for you. Any other upgrades do you envision for Digit? I don't know something you mentioned the hand for example but something radically i don't know if you're willing to share like something you would love to add or not possible either. sure you know what's exciting is we're kind of we're almost to the point where the basic features like the binary features of what needs to be part of the robot in order for it to do useful things are all there um and of course there's going to be a hundred years and more of improvement and iteration and uh, innovation in order to make those things much, much more effective. Um, 
the the biggest things coming on our robot are you know the 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 manipulators and having that be super effective we we want the robot to operate effectively in the world and you know it's it's still an open question of what exactly do manipulators look like that are as multi-purpose as possible how general can a manipulator be and how do you create that do you make super specialized manipulators and do tool changes do you do a five finger to hand so that you can do all the things you know we have spe specific opinions about the path to take on that but i'd say that's going to be an area ripe for innovation for a long time i would say too that our robot mobility what the robot does now is is above the bar and good enough for our use case but we know exactly how to do so much better and like you know, as the technologist in the company, I'm so interested and like excited about making that better. Um, but you know, we got to have our priorities. So, you know, we, you, you saw that Cassie, you know, won a hundred meter dash Guinness world record, uh, using a learned policy and that gate really captures the dynamics of what locomotion can be and is, is just beautiful. It's capturing the right dynamics. And, and Digit is capable of doing that, but we just haven't put the resources into doing that. So that's one thing I'm excited about is making sure that when this robot is just walking around the warehouse and picking things up, it's got this totally natural motion and natural movement that is not natural for the sake of looking that way, but is natural because it's capturing the right physics for really the efficiency and the robustness of um, moving things around and getting around in that space. And when you do capture those physics just right, um, then it looks totally natural and it looks totally, um, I don't know, familiar to people. We've got kind of a recognition of when something moves right, the same way we do as like recognizing faces and things like that. So that's, that's one of the things I'm excited about. I don't know if those are the best answers. Like what's, you know, what are the features that are coming? It's, it's a lot about making the robot do the job, do it well, do the self chart. Oh, you know what? I thought of one. It's, the massive, massive software piece of being able to control fleets of robots. You know, right now we're demonstrating one robot doing one task, but getting thousands of robots coordinated and aligned so that you can then have the remote service, people telepresencing into the machines so that they can get the robots unstuck or, you know, log in remotely so they can interact with a person nearby and then coordinating that thousand robots to do the job and integrating that with the warehouse management system. That's a big lift. That's a big piece of software. And, um, uh, you know, that's a, a major feature that's yet to come for us. Final words, let's see. Final words. Um, you know, I would just say I'm really excited about this human-centric focus that because we're building robots that operate in human spaces, have the opportunity to be multi-purpose and start to do a number of different useful tasks. And we're entering this new era of robots that are like that. Robots that can work on our terms instead of having to create an environment around the robot. We just have a robot walk into our spaces and our workplaces. Um, and then having it be useful for many different tasks, it's sort of like the difference between a camera and a smartphone. Um, most pictures are taken on a smartphone because everybody has one on them because it's so useful for so many different things. And that's what Digit is gonna be like. There's gonna be so many of them out there because it's useful for so many different things. Um, and I'm, I'm just really excited about that.